The Living Zen Podcast is a gift from the members and associates of the Victoria Zen Center to you. If you enjoy it, please be sure to let your friends know about Living Zen. If you'd like to support our community, download the Living Zen Podcast app for iPod, iPhone, and Android. One of the most meaningful ways to show your support is by becoming a part of our Sangha as an associate. Your commitment of $10 a month will ensure that offerings like the Living Zen Podcast and our online eZendo will continue to be available around the world to everyone with an interest in truly living Zen. To become an associate, please visit our website at zenwest.ca and click on Become an Associate. Many more Zen Talks are available for purchase on iTunes and Amazon.com. Just search for Venerable Eshu Martin. These talks are also available for free on our website to all members and associates of the Victoria Zen Center. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your support. Any questions? Oh, I'd love to hear more about oceans and waves. <laughs> Ian's your guy. No. Well, anything specific? I need a que- I need a question to respond to. Like, you never apologize about, about talking about oceans and waves. Repetition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a. Uh, well, part of it that came up recently was I, I had a conversation with somebody who, um, they're quite uh, intellectually very sharp. And I think that Buddhism is becoming quite popular, is becoming, is, is quite popular, I think, more and more in North, North America and the West. And unfortunately, the source of a lot of the popularity is like mass media and entertainment. And so a lot of the sort of um, more subtle aspects of the teaching get kind of lost for, you know, impact and humor. Like there's a great episode of The Simpsons where Bart is competing in a mini golf competition and Lisa takes him out and starts, starts, you know, giving him koans, right? <laughs> so, as a, as a practitioner, it's kind of great and funny to see that kind of stuff, but when you think that, you know, a person's first brush with the Dharma is like Bart and Lisa Simpson, right? Uh, some, some misunderstandings are bound to ensue. And one of the ones that's quite dangerous, as I was talking about, is this sort of... Um, idea of kind of like crushing, destroying the self. And there's even whole sort of traditions, or I don't know what, I guess, whole, like uh, the New Age, there's a lot of New Age uh, stuff that kind of gloms onto this. And uh, fr- from my perspective, or in my opinion, when you, when you press that, that direction, it becomes quite dangerous. When I first came to the Victoria Zen Center, and it's very common in Zen centers to have this misunderstanding. I always talk about this because when I first came, uh, especially over a cup of tea, I'd like to talk about this. When I first came, uh, uh, the biggest um, topic of conversation at the circle, which was much smaller than this, maybe four or five people, would be about what the tea, what, who's bringing the tea and cookies next week. And that was sort of like... There was none of this deep sharing or anything. It was like, the reason though was because when you went around the circle, the, the sort of belief or the sort of attitude was that to have any kind of opinion or to stand on anything or to have any kind of anything was just not Zen, right? And so I always found this really kind of disturbing because I would say like, you know, well, what about this? And everyone would go, hmm, oh, I have... I neither, you know, agree or disagree with that. And it was just like this weird, and I I mean, you could say, you know, I think, you know, we should handle overpopulation by eating babies or something like this. And and they, "Mm, I neither agree nor disagree with that statement. And I think that this is, this is a really sort of um, uh, misunderstanding of this teaching. And it's, it's really crucial to understand that 
When we do that, what we do then is we just create a self that's unattached and we attach to that and we become this sort of unattached spiritual self. And when I was training, they always, we always, the, the monks would always say, you know, uh, you always know uh, people who are like this when they do walking meditation, they're like... <laughs> And so often when you're in training, you'd be doing walking meditation and the Jiki Jitsu would just take off running, right? And, and everyone has to kind of go, right? And this is why the transitions are, are always, um, particularly in Rinzai Zen, everything requires a real, like a strong manifestation. Like you can't kind of like uh, pour the tea or... Yeah, you've got to... When you're chanting, you've got to like fully embody this chant. And the... And the the whole style of the form is about um, experiencing the completion of this activity, dissolving completely when we sit, just completely melting into unification, dissolving into the experience. And then there's this bell and a clap, and, and you've got you've to just embody, you've got to manifest completely, poof, bow, stand up, and then you start walking. And it's not this sort of like, slow like kind of <laughs> walking it's like you're walking and and then you've got to the you know the walking period ends and you sit back down and then you dissolve this activity of uh, doing the prostration it's i love prostrations because they are the complete embodiment of that activity right you you start as the sort of the mountain <laughs> and then as you exhale you completely dissolve into a puddle on the floor, completely letting go of self. And then uh, when you've emptied yourself out completely, you are born again and you come back up. And you're not the same self. It's a new self. And we do that three times because, you know, I think people's idea is, oh, I just got to get rid of myself and, you know, then everything will be cool. But it's like that's something that never ends. Every time a self arises, we think, oh, maybe this is the good self. You know? Maybe now I'm the Buddha self. Uh, and uh, it's, it's this whole activity of arising and dissolving and arising and dissolving. And there's nowhere to rest. That's the, uh, this is where no self, this is the teaching of no self, is that we're always looking for a place to stop. We're always looking for the, 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 the end place, right? It's, and we always put it, oh, when I get that degree, then I'll be set, right? And oh, uh, when I get that job, uh, that'll take care of everything. Well, when my knee heals, everything will be perfect. You know, we always have these, we always have these sort of things out there. But I can ask everyone in the room, is it true? Like, did that thing that you set up actually finish everything off? And now it, it's all an activity, right? So it's, it's like, regardless of how many times we have that experience that that belief isn't true, that the fixed place or the fixed self, we keep perpetuating this idea that that's going to that's gonna happen. And then we come into Zen and we go, this, it's not stuff, this is like, Buddhism, and then I'm going to be awakened, and then everything will be cool, right? <laughs> and the awakening is that it doesn't end, that it's this continuous activity, that there is no place, that there is no self, that there is no fixation, there's no land or solid or object in it. It's all just activity. And so when we talk about letting go of the nature of self, It isn't that there aren't things, and it isn't that there isn't a me that, you know, I I was saying on Sunday, it's very important that you know, I am me, and that is a bus, and I need to move. (laughs) You've got to know that, or else you're in big trouble. Uh, But it's to understand that, that these, neither I, nor the bus, nor the flower, nor anything is in any way fixed or lasting or permanent or it's going to be like that. And there's no aspect of any of those things that you can remove and say, I have bus essence or, you know, I have Doshu's soul or anything like this. All of these things are constantly uh, transforming. And what's important about that is that when you start to investigate how you live your life, you start to see more and more the places where you're imputing that self, where you're in, you're giving things the property of permanence. You know, we go, oh, 
oh God, you know, the relationship broke up or I lost the job. And because our self, who we think of ourselves as, is married to that, is completely uh, uh, fused to our experience, our relationships and our jobs and our uh, environments, then when the natural occurrence happens, which is that they deteriorate and fall apart, uh, what we have to understand is that the real problem is not that those things happen, that's very natural, is that we die, that the self that we've been holding on to, that we identify ourselves as uh, this person who does this and I'm with that person, if any one of those components falls away, that self dies and we have to become something new. And that's, if we're attached, if we're really fixed on being that person, that's a really hard thing to do. So uh, when we let go of the idea of a fixed self, it's not that we don't appreciate or we don't uh, enjoy. In fact, if anything, we do more because when we're with somebody, there is a moment-to-moment awareness of the transience of that relationship. That uh, when we see a flower, that we don't go, oh, it's a flower. But it's a, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience that's totally transitory. I will change. That flower is... It's not I will change even. I am changing. The flower is changing. And we've come across one another in this beautiful, like, two waves, you know, like... Like, ah, wonderful. Uh, And so your environment, you can look at and go, geez, this is amazing. Hmm. (laughs) Uh, It sounds crazy, but this is the way that uh, I choose to live life. And you can choose to live your life is in a a state of kind of constant uh, awe or constant amazement of uh, very uh, mundane things. So, how's that for the ocean? Yeah, it's it's it just never ends. That's the that's the thing. I mean, you're always investigating. There's always something. It's just like with this whole taking my kids out of homeschooling thing. It's like you know you think you're doing fine, and then you start to look at, you start to see where you've created things. And then you go, oh, are they really things? Like, are they really sort of like objects to be? And, and they just, everything just slips through your fingers. And you go, ha, ah, cool. That too is flowing. So, yeah. Nifty. Just to comment, there is no stillness in the bottom of the ocean. It's all moving. Of course. Of course. <laughs> well, it's just like... The, the, oh, uh, Doshi's going to start sweating soon. No, it's absolutely true. It's just like the whole concept of emptiness, right? Like <laughs> emptiness from the perspective of Buddhism isn't void. You know, it is, it's the mother of all things. It's like infinite potential. Just nothing's stuck its head up yet, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks for listening to the Living Zen Podcast. If you follow Living Zen through iTunes, I would very much appreciate it if you would take a moment to let me know what you think about it by rating or reviewing the podcast so that new listeners can also hear what you have to say. Thank you for your time and for your support.